Hey, this is a clip from Quincy Carrier live on the OBR where I stream Mondays at 7 p.m. I had my friend Jacob Roach on. Um, we had an interesting conversation about the Cleveland Browns here, so check it out. Quincy Carrier Live's first guest, Jacob Roach. Jacob, man, how are you doing? I'm good. I decided for a Christmas mustache, so we're just going to see it how looks that nice. I like the, I like the look, man. I like the look. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you were in here for my conversation about Jameis Winston. I talked about yeah. him as a relief pitcher, right? Like somebody, mm -hmm. like a middle relief guy or maybe a fringe fifth starter. I don't know how much of a baseball guy you are. But every team has the guy where you're like, oh, yeah, like you, you throw him in, but it might be a bullpen game, right? Yeah. Do you think the Browns are willing to get creative enough if they have to work around a solution like that with Jameis, because I think that's what's required with Jameis. Like you cannot go into the season with Jameis Winston and think, oh yeah, he's just going to hold it down for 17 games and give you no reason to ever bench him. Right. Like you're going to have to have like some kind of like, Hey, we could put somebody else in for a couple quarters. And then we know we're going to go back to Jameis and start the next game, see what he got. But if we got to pull him in a third, we'll pull him in a third. Like there. <laughs> There was a conversation after the second game, the Saints game, I think it was, where there were rumblings that they wanted to change quarterbacks then. Mm -hmm. And and like you were talking, you know, just a couple of weeks, you were then a week and a half off of him shredding Baltimore, and they were already like, I don't know, because this guy went out there and just like, yeah, you know, we've seen him be creative in the past. I, I think I heard you earlier talk about Jacoby Brissett. It, um, and I think you almost, if you're going to bring back Jameis, you've got to have another veteran on that roster. Mm -hmm. you, you, you've got to be ready to be like, okay, I'm not a hundred percent like fully Jameis for 17. No, I, I, I don't know that you can do that. Um, and that is where I'm kind of starting to lean towards like, I'm not sure this is going to be a reunion here going on. Like, because if Kevin Stefanski's here, um, I think that's the big That's thing. another thing that we got to talk about. Uh, Kevin has definitely created a culture in, in, in this building. And um, look, man, there were issues with how uh, exuberant of a personality Kareem Hunt was at times with, with, with yeah. the inner workings and culture of this building. Kareem ain't got nothing on Jameis exuberance, right? Like, I imagine he's driving them crazy, right? If Baker Mayfield was enough to drive you crazy the Jameis Winston like I could I I would like to know if you just got Kevin Stefanski away from the cameras and you brought up the idea of him starting Jameis Winston for 17 games what is his instant reaction look like because I can't imagine that like it's a calm feeling that washes over him right like th this does not seem like the kind of dude that Jay that Kevin is like, yeah, man, let's rock. Like, I think Kevin was thinking about it like I was. We're like, he's a really good middle relief guy. If Deshaun yeah. goes out for four games, we can be fine with Jameis. I'm not going to lose my mind for four weeks. I'll even let Ken call the plays so I don't yeah. get mad. <laughs> right? Like, you can already see that they're mitigating for the frustration that they're having with Jameis because I don't think it's a coincidence that, like, oh, Jameis gets named the starter and Kevin's not calling the plays anymore, right? Like, I feel like that was, hey, I'm not trying to be driven crazy right now. Right? The thing that I come back to that's always the whole, like, I, I come back to over and over again is I've asked, been asked a bunch of times about, like, which quarterbacks make sense in the draft and, and things like that for Kevin Stefanski. And the things I always come back to is risk adverse, Jameis is the opposite of risk averse. That's why I was confused when they signed him. I was like, uh, in terms of backups, veterans that are available, like, yeah, he he definitely was one of the top guys up there. And they wanted to get a little younger from Flacco because I think there was some concern, and we've seen it play out, that maybe last year was not something that Flacco could replicate at this time. But, like, I'm having fun right now because there's really nothing to play for. But I saw other people bringing it up if there was something to play for and Jameis was out here doing it all the time, how I would feel and how Kevin would probably feel. And, um, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. <laughs> we know.
right now he's an unserious man on uh, for an unserious time for the Cleveland Browns. So I don't think people mind, right? And yeah. I think I mentioned that earlier in the show. Where I'm like, he's unserious, but he plays the most serious position in the in football, for which is probably the sport we take the most serious in this country, at least. Um, yeah. And that's going to be a problem eventually for this yeah. team if it continues, right? Especially if this is a part of the season that you starting to take seriously that he's mm-hmm. doing all of this on, right? That to me is the thing that I think the Browns need to keep an eye out for. I mean, why I just don't see them going like, oh yeah, like they're definitely not in the let's just lock them up right now camp. Like I, I, I hate to like speculate, but you remember how Kevin was smiling ear to ear when Joe Flacco was in that room, right? Mm-hmm. And everything with Joe Flacco. Those are two dudes oh, yeah. from the East Coast that understood each other, right? Like Joe yeah. loved it, Kevin loved it, and you could just see it visibly in his face. Hey, man, I don't yeah. see a lot of shots with Kevin Stefanski and Jameis Winston in it. <laughs> like, like, I don't feel like those two personalities mesh super well. Um, and like, you just look at some of the personalities that haven't worked. Obviously, it's not going to be something that meshes well. And we talk about a whole year with this dude yeah. being the most important player or the most of, starting at the most important position, the de facto leadership position. And I just, I have a hard time believing the Browns are going to do this and like, just be like, yeah, man, we rolling with Jameis. Like, maybe he wins a competition. Right, yeah. but the idea that like you just gonna anoint Jameis these dudes, yeah, it does not make a ton of sense to me. Um, but the issue that the Browns have is like, hey, how many guys out there will make sense for you? Yeah, Jacoby. Yeah, and it's like you can't yeah. really Jacoby and be like, yeah, we rolling with that like the whole year. Like that's that's a very temporary. You drafted somebody, move like you're gonna start them at the eight weeks or something like that. Um, so it's like, maybe you go Jacoby, I, Sam Donald's one that you can roll in and start, but like Sam Donald does not have the personality of Jameis Winston, but he still does stuff on the football field that I think would drive Kevin a little bit crazy, right? Like still has that tendency to kind of, uh, fade away and just, yeah, Mm, (laughs) he just jumps in there. Yeah. Yeah. The question is if Baker Mayfield bothered you, why would it Sam Donald? bother you right and you're talking about an actual commitment with sam darnold uh i was actually having a conversation with my brother about this before the show and it's like the more generic a personality like yeah, the yeah. better is probably there with him like i watch college football and people go oh drew alert no drew alert be taking all the risk right but you know oh, who yeah. might make sense dylan gabriel right like or somebody like that where it's like hey dylan gabriel does what he's told like played a lot of football like i i i think i got i think i got a, a a little bit yelled at by some people for suggesting the dylan gabriel thing but it's like dude's played 62 college games or whatever he's a rhythm and timing in the right spot at the right time he'll do exact he's bo nix but left-handed and a little bit Man, he's about the same athlete he's just a left-handed bo nix like and that's working out in denver like yeah, and if there's somebody who's looking at that and be like, I could work with that for two years, mm-hmm. I think Kevin's on the list of guys that will look at that, right? Um, yep. I think Carson Beck has been a bit bit erratic um, in his tape. I don't know. When you look at Carson Beck, mm-hmm. I have this struggle because there's Carson Beck you saw last year yeah, when he had actual wide receivers, and then there's the dude that you see this year. And I think it was helpful to see that half of football he played, they played without Carson Beck in there because like, hey man, say what you want about Georgia's offense right now. It looked worse once he got out there. Like they had that one drive, but boy, was that a mess after he got hurt. They had, they had a one wide receiver or there were um, wide receivers, not counting the running backs and the tight ends. But in that game, Georgia had 41 yards receiving from wide receivers in that game, and they were all one person. And then that was – that, which is just not – and they lead the country. They're at like 40 drops right now, something like that. Like it's it's outrageous mm-hmm. number. And like Carson Beck is 
Carson Beck is was if if Kevin Stefanski designed a quarterback, it was Carson Beck. And I, I know a lot of people are going to come at me for it because, like you said, the guy this year is not what that guy was last year. But that guy last year was a dude. And if mm-hmm. somebody can find a way to get that Carson Beck back out there, like the dude that he hasn't turned the ball over, you know, I know he gets the turnover that gets him hurt at the end of the game, but he had 11 touchdowns, no turnovers the last three games going into the SEC championship game, rhythm and timing, right place, right time, all those things. Like people aren't going to like it, but like if I right now gun to my head, Kevin Stefanski quarterback, it's Carson Beck. Yeah. And, the, the problem with like, especially like the sports talk around the draft is that the nature of it's going to be super reactionary, right? Where people are like, yeah. oh, you got to take this guy off your board or whatever it is. Like people yeah. react super harshly to one or two games or like they'll throw the mid label on you and just like not really evaluate it. But yeah. that's the thing with Carson Beck. He is mid and yeah. mid get the job done sometimes, right? Like I think we mitted ourselves out of seeing the value of, of Bo Nix last year. Where it was like, oh, he's mid. Yeah. Right. And people are like, hey, he's mid. He's not going to be able to do anything. But we forgot mid ain't always bad. Right. It ain't Reggie. Right. Like there, there are things out there that are worse than mid. Uh, and Carson Beck is mid. Right. Like I, Dylan gave you is mid. Like the best you you don't draft mid in the first round. But if you get mid in the third round. I don't think that's a bad thing, right? Like, or or even in the second round, right? If you could get them late enough back there. And it's just, we get so caught up on these labels with these guys. And then like, people are like, oh, I don't ever want to draft them at any point of the game of the draft. And it's like, now we're just, we're talking ourselves out of players who would actually make sense in that draft spot, because there's no reason that you should be not willing to take a quarterback in the third round of this draft, right? Like, there are enough guys there where I'm like, eh, yeah, they're in the third round, it makes sense, right? Like, you probably yeah. do it. Yeah, third, yeah, for sure day two, because, like, the, the, the drop-off in terms of even just the salary of a quarterback going from first to second, you know, the second or third round, it's it's beneficial for you in, in, in that sense, too. Mm-hmm. But, like, yeah, you're – Everybody got caught up in that. There was a really bad stretch for Carson Beck where he turned it over multiple times in like four straight games and all this stuff. I'm with you. It, it's so fun to watch these because all of a sudden, you know, Aller's back up there because he has a good game against Oregon. <laughs> and don't get me wrong. He got one of the highest ceilings in this class. But it was like I got told when like I put him in a mock in like the third round. I was like, hey, this is a high ceiling guy. You don't want him to play right away. Everybody's like, no. You're stupid. A month later, he has a good game, and everybody's like, listen, we got to take him number eight overall. And I'm like, we have got to be careful in what we're doing Mm -hmm. in terms of the spikes and the lows and all this stuff. It's like, you know, if you think that a stretch of games or a year um, really plummets a guy's like who he is, you're like, ah, this guy stinks. He's, He's in the bottom after this bad year why can't he get better? Like we, we got to remember you can bring a guy in and you can develop him and he can grow and he can get back to places or he can go above. And it's just like, I see Serge said in the chat too, we're 500 with mid right now. I've watched some in Baker is playing awesome in Tampa Bay, but when he was in Cleveland, he was very mid. He was really good with Kevin Stefanski. Then he was hurt. Jacoby. Jacob, that brings up a great point. Mid is just an average, right? Mid does not be – there is the Kirk Cousins mid, which I would call Olive yep. Garden mid, which is like everything on the every, everything on the menu going to be cool. It ain't yep. going to blow you away, but it's going to be pretty good for 10 bucks, right? Yep. Like you you going to get a good time, right? Yep. Baker Mayfield is what I call Little Caesars Pizzas mid, which is like, hey, okay. sometimes that Little Caesars Pizzas tastes more than $5. Sometimes you eat cardboard from Little yeah. Caesar, right? Like it, yeah. it is, <laughs> it is just one of those things that wildly fluctuates, right? That's yeah. the mid that Baker Mayfield provides you. Because what, even in that game, brother, through two interceptions, mm-hmm. like is what it is. But you know, was able to get it out there. And in the NFC, I don't think that's a big of a deal as it is in the AFC, um, especially when you're not in the AFC North. He literally went from the best division in football to the worst division yeah. in football. And I think that helps him out as well. But he was mean. But it, we, we again, we classify a lot of things under mid, and we confuse yeah. mid with bad. 
but mid is not bad. It's just not Pat Mahomes, right? Yeah. Like, and what I see in this class is like, it's some mid in this class, but that doesn't mean that there's not somebody who could it be a starter for a couple of years, right? Like, if you if you think about the the mid label on Carson Beck, think about it this way, it, and it, it, you look at 2023 Carson Beck and 2024 Carson Beck, you're not going to tell me that in 23 he was mid because he was he was good, he was really good. Now think about what's different. Mm -hmm. uh, his offensive line is a is a little hasn't played as well in 24. He lost Brock Bowers and Ladd McConkey, and his wide receivers lead the nation in drops. Fix that. Say you fix that. He comes in. He's got Jerry Judy, David Njoku, a, a healthy said Tillman. Maybe you add, an, maybe you get Luther Burden in the first or something crazy like that, and you mm -hmm. fix an offensive line. Oh, all of a sudden you've elevated that mid to the Kirk Cousins mid to the to the guy that was supposed to be QB one this year in Carson Beck because that's what he was last year was was quarterback one in for almost everybody coming into this summer and this beginning of this college season. And it's just like, well, put the things you, you need to put everything right around him, which is what Baker was here and even some in Tampa as well because he's got all his weapons. Okay, that's fine. I because you're not going to find Pat Mahomes just growing on trees, but I can find something that I can dress up and it and make it look really good, like a Thanksgiving turkey or like a Little Caesars pizza at two in the morning. <laughs> yep, yep. You know, or or Taco Bell, right? You get the five layer burrito. You don't know how many beans you about to get in right. that five layer burrito, right? You might get a lot, you might not. Um, it depended on what your taste buds are like or how you feel it at that time. It might hit it. Might might not, right? It's no quesarito, but you know what? Hey, the right five layer burrito don't taste that different. Um, and that's the thing too, when it comes to quarterback, I think a lot of people are like, oh, you got to decide a year and then do everything you can to get that quarterback that year. But if you look at how most teams find quarterbacks, they're doing what they can every year to win as many games as possible. And then the opportunity comes where they see somebody in the draft. We're like, I like them. Let's take them whether that be in the first, second, third round, or, you know, it might be a situation where you got Alex Smith and maybe Carson Beck could be your Alex Smith and you, you do what you can for a couple of years with that. And then you see somebody who you think could be your Pat Mahomes and you go out and you get that guy, right? Like the, the you can't force the timeline. You can't dictate the timeline with quarterback. You just got to take what's available and do the, get the most you can out of it, right? That's why all these quarterbacks end up signing extensions that are extension worthy because you can't, it's just so hard. Um, and if you're looking at the Browns, you're looking at what their strength has been as far as quarterback has been. And it's like, hey, like you have found a way to get the most out of so, these certain guys, right? Like even DTR, I would argue you probably got more out of him than a lot of other teams would have been able to get out of DTR. I um, mean, who knows what else they're going to be able to squeeze out of him. But Carson Beck is not DTR. He's 6'4", he's 220, he has very strong arm, right? Like um, he's worked in a system where he is expected to kind of be what the Browns expect them to be. Like, this is somebody that everybody thought, okay, well, maybe you can get Kirk Cousins. And I always say, somebody compares a quarterback to Kirk Cousins, maybe you don't draft him in the first round, right? Like, yeah. maybe that's the red flag. It's like, okay, yeah, because you wouldn't draft Kirk Cousins in the first. Kirk Cousins was a fourth-round pick, right? But if we're getting into day two, mm -hmm. and he's falling, it's like, why not, right? Like, at that point, what's really the risk? Um, and I think that's somewhere I think Browns fans and I think a lot of people who look at the draft should get into because I think we're getting so caught up in, oh, he's not, this class does not have uh, somebody who's going to step in and, and be a top, like even Shador Sanders, who a lot of people feel like is number one quarterback in this class. You know, you press somebody to ask them who they compare him to, it's probably like Geno Smith. That's what I've heard from a lot of people, yeah. And it's like, Geno Smith, is that really that different to say this dude could be Kirk Cousins? Really. Ain't that what we say right now with Jameis Winston? <laughs> like, oh, he could be Geno Smith. Like, I said that. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Said that. Yeah, like he could be Geno Smith. And it's like, okay, if you're already there with Shador Sanders, it's like, yeah, like should you really be doing that in the first round? Like, for me, and I don't know how you feel about it. When I look at quarterback in the first round, I think of it like this. If you don't believe that quarterback is like one of the five best players in that draft class or something very close to that, you have no business taking that guy in the first round. 
Right. Like it's just too much of a commitment. If you like you not five best quarterbacks, but like, hey, this is one of the five. Best, like you got Abdul Carter in quarterback number one right there like and then genty right like he's smack dab you think this is one of the best prospects if you don't feel that way about that dude then you don't need to take that dude in the first round um and i can see very easily that there's not going to be a quarterback that anybody feels that way about but that might lead to teams making decisions in the offseason that might lead to some quarterbacks like you know what a lot of the quarterbacks that are successful in the nfl aren't the ones that were overwhelmingly amazing prospects Dak prescott yeah. fourth round pick seemed as flawed coming out of Mississippi State. Jalen Hurts, seen as flawed, right? Like, if you look at all these reports, like, I bet mids all over those reports. Like, like, oh, yeah, he has this, this and that. But that doesn't mean that that player can't develop into something that's ultimately useful for your team. And you just got to trust that your organization does not, like, give the franchise commitment to some mid, right? Like, as long as you treat mid like mid, it's fine. Yeah, because you take Carson back in the se- even in the second. Let's say which they're in like they're at pick like thir- 40 right now, I think, or something thirty nine, something like that is their second round pick. Mm-hmm. Like there is a lot of pressure and expectation on a top ten pick. Pick number forty, if it doesn't work out as a quarterback, like pick number forty is almost like picking the dude like a position player in the day three. Because once you get outside of picking a quarterback in the top 10, the expectation and stuff around it goes down and you can allow that guy to actually develop and you can allow that guy to actually go out there and have some stumbles and some things like that. And It's just like I, you're not finding Caleb Williams. You're not finding Jaden Daniels. You're not finding Drake May. OK, let me go from the second tier and add a really, really good player in the first. Yeah, like the bar for like a first round. Jed Wills got scrutinized his whole career in Cleveland because yeah. he was the 10th overall pick. Um, Mike Mike Hall had like two good games and then got injured. And we're like, no, nah, that was a hit like in the second right. round. Like the bar for it is just so different, right? Or uh, like Grant Delpit got an extra contract. We ain't thought about that since, right? Obviously, there are outliers like JOK is like, okay, that, that's a home run for a second round pick. Do you think the perception of Andrew Berry changes if he takes JOK in the first round instead of like uh Greg Newsom that year? Like and JOK still becomes JOK. Like, because I think a lot of the perception about Andrew Berry as a draft uh guy is yeah. somewhat earned. He's been inconsistent, but I'm like, I think it has a lot to do with the first round picks not hitting the two years he's had them. Yeah, because because the first round picks turn into Jed Newsom and Watson because you have to put all that Mm -hmm. Watson first round pick on there because it's like because I've said before like when I'm looking at it I'm like he's hit on every second round pick while Michael Hall is still up in the air and things like that but but yeah you're right now Jed's gone he's make he's not getting a second contract Newsom's probably not getting a second contract right now but if you're telling me uh, he drafted an all pro in the first round in JOK yeah no I do I think because especially in Andrew Barry's case, there's only two of them. Yes. And since none of you, the margin for error is like, if you hit on one of them, it's 50%. It's, it's significantly higher than 0% that it is right now. So yeah, yeah, I, I definitely think so. It, it, because a lot of people don't remember who was a third, fourth, fifth round pick. They don't remember that stuff in the middle. They just remember the ones because that's, in most cases, people don't dive it, don't have a sickness like me and dive into everything that goes outside of the first round. <laughs> yeah, I think that's where where my outlook has been on this, right? Like, I, I think if they draft well and they take care of things and they just don't overcompensate for the yeah. failure of Deshaun Watson, you can end up in a place where you're a surprise 10 win team like the Broncos are this year, right? Uh, yeah. Maybe that, and who, who knows who the quarterback is for that but like maybe that's the case for you is be dylan gabriel and like oh yeah it's a surprise like he came out of college he's short all this stuff tony gross he's gonna hate him but you know oh, it, like, <laughs> like he's short and he's left-handed like he's not gonna love yeah. that but and he's if, yeah if you get the 10 games here like okay fine whatever it is or you could have a couple of good seasons you don't have to commit yourself long term to him and that resets the money and like it, think about it like this if you could get four years of a quarterback 
on a rookie contract that's not a first round pick, then like that just erases everything that you're concerned about with Deshaun Watson going forward. Because basically, if you get some mid there, you're like, okay, you're overpaying for some mid for a couple of years, but then come 2027, you're back under the table uh, when it comes to the salary cap value of that. So it's like, okay, like. It's, it's a it's a very like positive scenario for the Cleveland Browns if like one of these guys becomes another quarterback that you don't want to give like you know what I think Geno Smith got twenty two million sounds right yeah yeah Geno Smith got like twenty two Baker got like twenty five or something like that like maybe you want to give this dude eighteen over three well not 18 over three but 18 by three right like somewhere along that lines inflation probably gonna roll it up to like twenty one twenty two um, but you'd rather be in that spot than where the Browns are because you just need to get to a place where you can maintain structure until the right guy comes along that you have a chance to go get at the quarterback position, right? Like, that is what Andy Reid did with the Chiefs, where it's like, hey, that thing was not a dynasty. They were another team that was getting eliminated in the second round a ton um, with Alex Smith because their limitation was clearly the quarterback position. Uh and then they got somebody who cleared that limitation. The right opportunity popped up. They took advantage of it, and then they elevated. And right now, if you're the Browns, you want to make sure that you're not going back to hiring coaches and GMs every year. So you need to have some level of success to be able to maintain that. Um, and the way that you do that is, hey, you might have to live with some minute quarterback. But mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you right now, I've been a Browns fan my whole life, Jacob. You have too. We ain't going to be able to tell the distinction from mid and good because we ain't never seen mid for real. Like, no, no so. not consistently. We, we, we get like a glimpse of it here and there. You get Derek Anderson in 07, you know, and like that was a lot of fun. And, you know, and then you get the – I will never forget how many times I saw the Brian Hoyer as 10 and 6 as a starter graphic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Dude, yeah. You, you, you roll out like – you you say you get Bo Nix level, and Bo Nix has turned it on lately. I, I will say that, but you get Bo Nix level play for the next like four years. I'm good. Let's do it. Like, yeah. we, let's see where we, let's see what that looks like. You get Tua for the next yeah. four years, or or something like that. It's like okay, like. Browns fans will be excited, especially like it's just different when you trade for somebody versus like when you draft yeah. it. If it's somebody you drafted and. I know Browns fans because I used to do this too. I've done this with far worse quarterbacks. Than, okay. The, the Dilly Gabriel, right? Where yeah. the Browns draft them and you start watching those highlights and you start convincing yourself, hey, man, they might have found something with Cody Kessler, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> Kevin Hogan was mine. I was like, Kevin Hogan made like one start against Cincinnati and tore him up. And I was like, let's go. <laughs> like, yeah. Like it, it's, it, it's not going to be hard for you to get to a place. So like, yeah, you might turn your nose up at Carson Beck, but if Carson Beck has a 200 yard, a 300 yard game with a different team, you're going to be like, why the Browns ain't draft them. Right. Yeah. And it's, it, 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 they need to be willing this off season to one, be creative about how they're going to do this. And two, like open up all options. Okay, franchise guy, not in this draft class. The best guy in this class is getting compared to Geno Smith. That tells me there is no long-term answer at quarterback in the 2025 draft class, no matter what pick you have, right? In the 2026 class, it looks just as questionable, right? Like the guys I like in 2026 are like, well, I know Lenore Sellers is in that class. I don't know what he'll end up being. Um, but like K Kupnick or or Drew Allure could like stay an extra year and, and, and be in that class or something like that. No, like. Is- if Nuss goes back, he's probably your best shot. Garrett Nussmeyer at LSU, maybe. Yeah, I ain't betting on that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you have like those guys, right? Yeah. The guys who are like former top overall of recruits that you know have had a longer path, and maybe they get a hot season, right? Like maybe Miller Moss transfers somewhere and like Cooks or, or something like that, right? Like, there's always the possibility of that. But, like, 2027 is the only class I'm like, there's going to be guys in that class that are going to be, like, franchise. You look at DJ Lagway. You look at potentially, like, well, if you look at how the Mannings operate, it's not likely that Manning, I think, leaves that first year. So yeah, it's yeah. going to be 27 before you get yeah. a crack at Arch, I think. Yeah, so it's, like, 27 is probably the year. Like, I know uh, Ian just threw in Nico, Nico 
Imalava, who may or may not come out next year, right? Like he was a, another guy who was in that class with uh, Arch. But if I'm him, I would just, I would jump that year if I have any decent season next year, right? Because you already got the playoff year. So it, there's going to be some guys available, but I don't see anybody in these next two draft class that like sh shoots out to me like, hey, that might be a dude for real, right? And even the guy who might end up being a dude for you might be a Pat Mahomes situation where you got to just like see the good and hope you can develop it into the best. Same thing with Josh Allen happened, right? A lot of us want the easy answer at quarterback. They want the, okay, Andrew Luck is out. And yeah. we just get Andrew Luck. But one, that's never happening in Cleveland. We are no. never getting that lucky. Um, and two, hey, man, that does not happen anymore. Like, Andrew Luck was the last guy that could ever be that. Like, every we have too much media now. We have too much access. to. They will find a hole in any prospect, and you'll find anybody that's willing to be like, no, nah, he's actually trash, right? Like, it's not going to be consensus anymore. And even with Andrew Luck, it wasn't like Andrew Luck won four Super Bowls, right? Like, and that had a lot to do with the Colts, but it's like you can't just sit here and hope that your quarterback position gets filled. You got to be proactive about it. And that's the thing about the Browns. Like, okay, let's be proactive. Let's build around the quarterback. Let's have the understanding that we need to be a good nesting spot for a quarterback, yeah. right? Maybe you draft that guy. Maybe you sign that guy, but you need to be a good nesting spot. The teams that have quarterbacks – that are good consistently, that never go through these slumps, are the teams that can nest quarterbacks. Kyle Shanahan, 49ers, drafted one of the worst draft trades of all time, never gets talked about because never. they nested such a good spot that Brock Purdy can get on there and look elite with that offense, right? That's what the Browns need to do. Kevin has showed you that he can, he might be able to cook that up if you get the right people there around him. Now, he needs to do the same thing with the run game. Right, because like I'm not satisfied with how the run game looks, but if we're talking about quarterback, we're talking about the future of this team. I think that's an important thing for Kevin to keep in mind.